People's Channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, hello there, it's six o'clock, and this is Jubes & Co. with me, Michelle Jubery, live again from outside Buckingham's Palace tonight. Coming up on the show, local election results. What do you make of them? What are your biggest takeaways? There's been so much analysis, so much prediction about what it means for next year's general election. What says you? And over in police, people are up in arms. I'll tell you why. All about beards. Do you think um, serving police officers should be allowed to have a hairy face? Yes or no? And by the way, in case you're wondering what's all this got to do with, it's all about PPE. I thought COVID was yesterday's news. And let's talk prisoners, shall we? Do you think that they should be able to plug the gaps in the labour market in this country? And are you having a coronation uh, get-together this weekend? Have you been allowed to put up your bunting? Uh, well, if you have, you might have uh, realised you've had to fill, fill in a, a three-page document to get permission. Or have you just put it up anyway? Has this world gone mad when it comes to red tape? We'll have it all to come. But before we get into it, let's bring ourselves up to speed with tonight's latest headlines. Michelle, thank you. Good evening. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom at 6pm. The Conservatives continue to suffer heavy losses in the local elections in England, with around three quarters of the votes counted. The Tories have so far lost control of 40 councils, including Stafford-on-Avon, where former Tory party chair Nadim Zahawi is MP. Labour has gained 17, including East Staffordshire and Swindon, while the Lib Dems have gained seven. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has admitted the results are disappointing, but Liberal Democrat leader Sir Ed Davies said the Conservatives should be worried about the next general election. These are some of our best ever results. They give us a great foundation for the next general election. There'll be Conservative MPs across the blue wall seats, across many of these areas, who will be really, really worried now that the Liberal Democrats could beat them at the next general election. Meanwhile, the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, believes he's now on course to become the next Prime Minister. 
We've just taken Medway for the first time since 1998. That is a very, very good night for the Labour Party. We didn't just get it over the line. We absolutely smashed it. And it's the same story yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. Same story in Plymouth, in Stoke, up in Middlesbrough. And these are the key battlegrounds as we go into the next election. And, and make no mistake, this means that we are on course for a Labour majority at the next election. Our other top story today, on the eve of the King's coronation, the King and the Prince and Princess of Wales have greeted well-wishers on the Mall. King Charles made a surprise appearance to meet with some of the thousands gathered outside Buckingham Palace. William and Kate joined the King for the walkabout. They praised the party atmosphere on the Mall and described the coronation as a great moment of celebration. The trio shook hands and took selfies with the crowds and there were cheers of God save the King. The royalists who've been camping out hoping to catch a glimpse of history being made described it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We were literally just walking back to the hotel and then we just saw everybody cheering and came over and then saw the king. And I got a shake of the hand. You, you got a shake got of the hand? I got through the crowd and I got a shake of the hand. Did he shake his hand? No, unfortunately I didn't, but anyway, it was still nice to see him. Come from Belfast to see him. It's my birthday tomorrow and I saw the king today. <laughs> Well, more than 400,000 people are to receive a medal in recognition of their contribution to the King's coronation. Police officers, choristers, military personnel and ambulance workers are among those who'll receive the award. Made of nickel silver, they feature a portrait of King Charles and the Queen Consort. And on the other side, a laurel wreath and the date of the coronation. Meanwhile, people travelling on the railways this weekend will be told to mind the gap by none other than the King himself. Joined by the Queen Consort, they recorded an announcement to be played at every railway and underground station across the UK, all weekend and on Bank Holiday Monday. My wife and I wish you and your families a wonderful coronation weekend. Wherever you are travelling, we hope you have a safe and pleasant journey. And remember... Please mind the gap. World leaders have been arriving at Downing Street ahead of the King's coronation. Leading the US delegation is Joe Biden's wife. The First Lady, Jill Biden, was met at Downing Street by Akshata Murthy, the Prime Minister's wife. Earlier, Rishi Sunak welcomed Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and New Zealand's Chris Hipkins. Both of them are vocal Republicans, but have said they'll swear allegiance to the King tomorrow. In other news, rail passengers face yet more disruption after RMT members backed further strikes over the next six months. Workers at 14 train operating companies have already announced plans to walk off the job next weekend. The strike will disrupt travel to the Eurovision Song Contest in Liverpool. The results saw over 90% of union members voting in favour of further industrial action. The World Health Organization has announced that COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. It's a step towards the end of a pandemic that has killed nearly 7 million people globally. But the director insisted countries should not let down their guard, warning the virus will be here to stay. An increasing number of scams are taking place through social media sites such as Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram. TSB Bank says 80% of its own cases in the three biggest fraud categories were through Meta-owned companies. Its fraud experts are warning users to keep an eye out for random messages claiming to be from family and friends. They say customers should contact the person in question before transferring any money. You're up to date on GB News. Now let's get back to Michelle.
thanks for that, Bethany. Well, I'm Michelle Dubry, and I'm keeping you company live until 7 o'clock tonight from Buckingham Palace. What a treat. Again, Alex Dean, the political consultant, keeps me company, as does Paul Embry, the author, fireman, and trade unionist. Good evening, gents. Good evening. What a treat. I can't believe you didn't get dressed up there. Well, well we matched, we snapchatted and made sure we were in the same outfit. Feel the need to get dressed up, to be honest. I know, I've got it all. I've, um, Rose between two thorns. Yeah, I look like uh, a tablecloth. I'm very well aware of that. But I thought to myself, you know, if you can't get into the spirit of the day before coronation, when can you get into oh, it? Eh? That's what I say. And you're certainly getting into the spirit. I am definitely getting I'm into the sure spirit. You. My little two year old's lent me his birth tie for the occasion. Bless him. Yeah, we well, don't, don't know anything about it, quite frankly. But anyway, yes, I like it. I like it. I feel um, today as well, especially, I have to say, we've been here all week. And today, uh, it has, it's got a lot busier. The vibe has got a lot more buzzier. Everyone is certainly getting ready for tomorrow. Are you? Um, I want your thoughts. You know the drill, don't you? GBviews at gbnews.uk is how you get hold of me on the email, or you can tweet me if that's your thing at gbnews. I've been asking you, haven't I, as well? Share with me some of your uh, coronation goings on. Have you got um, your conservatory ready, your garden, uh, your front window, whatever? Anyway, look at this uh, viewer image. I absolutely love it. This was sent in from one of my uh, viewers, Jamie, I think his name is. It's his mum. So this is his mum, uh, Jenny. She, this is all the way back in 1953, when she was just five years old. It was taken, of course, at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and Jenny was presented with the coronation cup at a street party. Let's have a little look at the cup. Absolutely love it. So this is Jamie. Oh, you didn't show me the cup. That's not the cup. That's a, a table. That's something different. Well, anyway, I've got the cup. Jamie sent it to me, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. So Jamie, uh, apparently Jenny, now lives in God's own uh, county, which is Yorkshire. You've got taste. That one that I've just shown you there, by the way, that was Dave's uh, little get up there. Did you see it? Uh, Puerto Ventura, he is in. So yeah, the sun, the coronation sunshine is hitting far and wide. I want your uh, thoughts, your pictures coming in. That's the email address, how you can get hold of me tonight. And I'll have some more coming up later on in the programme. But, of course, the big news of the day is the local elections. We haven't, of course, yet got all of the results. They're still coming through. But it has been clear, hasn't it, that it has not been a good night for the Conservatives. Of course, all the opposition parties uh, have seen gains with Labour. Uh, taking, and I mean, there's been a lot of celebration about this, the constituency of Medway, the Lib Dem sees Windsor and Maidenhead. Um, Alex, I'll start with you. What is your kind of key takeaway from some of the goes on? I, I, as I mentioned, we have not yet got the yeah. final results, but we've seen enough. So, point one, it's a bad night for the Tories, and anyone who pretends otherwise is um, whistling Dixie. Uh, and that's just good to say that, first of all. Obviously, governments often do badly midterm in local elections. This is worse than the norm. So that's point one. Point two is that it's not actually that great for Keir Starmer either. We've seen real surges for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, and therefore, whilst point three is that local elections are not great predictors for uh, general elections, that might imply a split on the left, which means it's not all fantastic for the opposition leader either. Uh, do you think it's fantastic for the opposition leader, Paul? No. Um, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party clearly have not sealed the deal with the electorate. Um, I mean, when you think of where Tony Blair was, uh, just a year or two out from the 1997 yeah, general election. Miles away from Labour that. absolutely smashed it and won, a, I think, a 179-seat landslide. Um, the Labour Party at the moment are nowhere near that territory. So, I mean, I think Alex's assessment was, was reasonably accurate. I, I think it's evident that many people, uh, many voters are falling out of love with the Tories but are not necessarily falling in love with Labour. If, if you look at Labour's share of the vote um, compared to last time, it increased but not by, my, by very much at all. They did make some inroads into Red Wall constituencies in, into those areas, those local authority areas where they were heavily in favour of Brexit and I think that will bring some solace to Keir Starmer but look he had a mountain to climb a few years ago um, and whilst the Labour Party has unquestionably made some progress up that mountain I think it's still a long long way from from the peak so I think to be honest anybody who says that the general election is in the bag for the Labour Party is delusional there is still everything to play for well yeah the projected national share the PNS apparently has been estimated it would put the Tories at 26 percent Labour at 35% and Lib Dems at 20 So basically, if yeah. all things was equal and it was the general election, it was mirroring this, that would be the result. Well, of course, it doesn't mirror that, and there's a good couple of reasons why. Uh, the first is that not all of the country was voting uh, yesterday. Uh, the se so let me do the objective thing before I do the subjective things. Objectively, much of the country didn't vote. It was only England and only bits of England. Also, objectively, 
local elections are different, not just because of much lower turnout, but because of the much stronger appearance of independent candidates. The seats that were being contested from 2019, 25% of them were held by independents. So it's quite hard to read. Even if you're Keir Starmer's biggest champion, you might argue it's hard to display that kind of momentum that he wants to show when so many seats were held before by, uh, by independents. But the other thing I think is worth bearing in mind is this. The comparisons that Paul was making, well, I think, are the right ones. You know, one of the seismic moments in British politics, this wasn't one of them. This feels much more like the Neil Kinnock on one side or Gordon Brown on the other side of the Tony Blair um, to you know, seismic moment. And the Kinnock school of thought, which is one more heave, with an 80-seat majority to overcome, plus the boundary changes. It's not gonna, that implies to me it's not enough in one go. He's, Keir Starmer has not seen the kind of momentum he needs to see. And I'm saying that whilst conceding, bad night for the Tories. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the big problem for Keir Starmer at the moment is I, I think he understands where the Labour Party needs to go. He understands the traje trajectory that's necessary to get, get the Labour Party into 10 Downing Street. I think the problem is largely he's shackled by a party, large parts of which simply do not want to go there. They are very uncomfortable with the kind of faith, family and flag stuff. They are very uncomfortable with the, the, the fact that he's said, look, we've got to embrace Brexit, it's done, it's over. Some people, I think, would like to reopen that wound. And the problem there is that projects the party nationally to the electorate as a party that is still a party, really. Um, elements of the far left, student radicals, social activists and middle, middle class liberals living in our fashionable cities and university towns. Um, and whilst that remains the case, I think that there are going to be large elements of red wall constituencies that are simply uncomfortable about going back to the Labour Party. The Labour Party, in short, the Labour Party hasn't yet changed enough. And there was a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but a bit of talk within the SNP basically suggesting that they feel that they would hold the balance of power yeah. in the next election. Do you agree with that? Well, there's two things. The first is the SNP's most important lesson to us of late hasn't been about whether they'd hold power. It's about how quickly politics can change. We've got a year to go before the next general election. We saw an SNP implosion in like a fortnight. So people that say they can predict now what a general election over a year away is going to look like based on these results, I think it is wrong. But the second SNP point is this. We didn't have local elections in Scotland this time round. Had we done, it's very likely we'd have seen a, a real plummeting of support for the SNP, uh, given what's been going on recently, arrests and all. So it seems to me if that, that's what they think, uh, they should think again. And what do you think about the whole SNP thing? Well, I think the, the danger for the Labour Party is if they are seen to be too close to the SNP. Um, the, the truth is that whilst the SNP is popular in Scotland, although not so much now, of course, uh, in England, I think there is a great deal of hostility to the SNP. So the, the Labour Party, I think, would do well to distance itself from the SNP and certainly not get into any discussions about possible arrangements with the SNP in the event of a, a hung parliament well, post the election. Even if they need to pragmatically, we've seen at elections in the past, the association is really harmful for exactly. Labour. So even if in HQ they're thinking, well, we may need to do a deal with the SNP, yeah. they shouldn't say anything don't, don't like that. that public. They've really got to play mm. it down. Let me ask the B word, because I've heard a lot of rumours and a lot of conversations today saying um, from certain camps saying this is a, a display of uh, anti-Brexit sentiment, a display uh, of people saying actually it's time to reverse Brexit. Did you see any of that or feel any of that? No, and I think on the right there's as much kind of antipathy for inverted commas not getting Brexit done or not having the Brexit that certain people wanted as much as there is on the left. Uh, or, I, mean, I know it's not a left-right issue, but broadly speaking on the left for saying they, don't, they want to unwind Brexit. What I can't deny, I think, looking at um, the results is if there's one takeaway, it's not pro-Labour, clearly. I, I think it's, it's, it's anti-Tory sentiment. The difficulty, for, um, the difficulty for Starmer and the opposition is whether that unifies and the splintering of current the, the, the change of support in our country at the moment between Labour, Lib Dem and Greens on one view taken to a national election that's not all bad for the Tory party that, that could look like a split Labour, uh, Lib Dem, uh, Green vote uh, in opposition for the Tories and in a first past the post system if your opponent's side is more divided than yours that's not so bad and, and, and the Brexit piece will carry the Tory uh, party through in the red wall because there's plenty of working class Labour people traditional Labour people who loaned their vote to the Tory party and still don't like what they see over their shoulder. Is that fair? Everything that, the, everything that the Labour Party does between now and election time has got to be geared towards winning back the hearts of mind and, and minds of people in the Red Wall. If they don't win those people back, they ain't going to win an election. So any suggestion from the Labour Party that you know, we should revisit Brexit, uh, any indulgence of, of that idea, I think would be suicidal. What the Labour Party needs to do is continue with the message, we accept, brace, uh, we accept Brexit. More than that, actually say we embrace Brexit. Uh, but, but more than that, we are going do you think they do, though, really? No, not privately. Of course they don't. 
most of them hate the idea, but you know, tactically they realise it would be crazy to say that. But what they do have to do is to start using the language of people in working class, blue collar, post-industrial constituencies they, who, who, are, who are interested in issues like national security and immigration and law and order and do want you know, more traditional values upheld and do have a bit of a small C conservative thread running through them. Those are the people who the Labour Party has frankly treated with contempt for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and as a result of that, they were annihilated in the, in the polls. The, the, the Labour Party actually has been losing the working class vote since around 2000, I think. Okay, um, and, and that needs to be priority number one for the Labour Party. Start employing the sort of language that is going to win back the hearts and minds of those people. And uh, I was seeing uh, what John Red was saying, was saying earlier on. He was saying the Tories are not Tory enough, and that was their problem. Do you agree with that? Oh, I think it's a peculiar um, instinct to look at polling results, which shows if there is one uh, clear winner, it's the Lib Dems um, doing well, with all the caveats about them doing better at local elections and low turnouts. Uh, it's a very funny thing to do, to look at a situation where the Lib Dems are surging and think we'd better move to the right. Um, from, I, I accept the point that parties need to have defined, clear blue water between them and their opposition. But for me, at the moment, uh, Rishi Sunak's best advantages are, one, that he seems to poll better than Keir Starmer's preferred Prime Minister, and two, a sense of calm and managerialism, as opposed, frankly, to his predecessors. You've got to double down on that, not double down on being more right-wing. And let's talk at ID uh, and turnout. So, uh, Hull, where I'm from, turnout was about 22%. And yes, I do know that local elections are historically much lower than a general election, but still... If 80% there or thereabouts of the electorate just can't be bothered to turn out and vote for whatever reason, if I was involved in politics or councils or whatever, I'd be looking in the mirror tonight and asking myself, what is going wrong so that 80% there or thereabouts literally do not turn out? I think that's appalling. I think there's millions of people in this country who are completely alienated from the political system, um, not just at a local level, except in that turnouts generally are low in local elections, but at a national level as well. There, there is a huge body of people who are what you might call social democratic in outlook economically. You know, they believe in a higher minimum wage, they believe in trade union rights, um, you know, they believe in fairness and economic justice, redistribution of wealth, levelling up, etc. But at the same time, are probably to the right on cultural issues. Um, do take an interest in issues like national security and law and order and all those things I said before. Want the small boats to, to end, want immigration sorted out. And those are the people who have been completely alienated by both parties, which have, over recent years, the, the, the main parties have embraced this kind of hyper-liberal, hyper-progressive agenda. Certainly Cameron put rocket boosters under it in the Tory party, and we know exactly what's been happening to the Labour Party over the last 30 years. So, in short, yeah, people are alienated for, from the political system, but for good reason, because no one speaks for them. I've seen a lot on the left, um, Alex, blaming the ID, the photo ID, and saying that's why people haven't well, been turning out. I mean, outside of a couple of campaigning organisations whose literal job it is to find that problem and to shout about it. The actual incidents of it being um, a, an issue are pretty small and isolated. Uh, look, if you're an electoral officer, if you're a returning officer, you don't want anything to go wrong. You don't want a single person to have a problem at the polls. But, you know, given what people were talking about, it's like the threat from Y2K. All these people ran around saying the sky was going to fall in and we woke up. Yeah, there were a couple of, there were a couple of issues, but, you know, most of our... Uh, this is a point that doesn't seem to land with uh, the people who talk about this the most despite their position on Brexit. Uh, most of our European neighbours use systems like this without any complaint or issue. Indeed. Well, what about you at home? Did you turn out to vote? Uh, did you actually vote or did you just turn out to spoil your ballot? Uh, or did you just leave it all together? Get in touch with GBviews at gbnews.uk is how you can reach me. I'll have some more uh, of your feedback in just a couple of minutes, including some of your coronation pictures. So do get them into me. Uh, but I also want to talk beards, bushy faces. Do you think police officers should have them? See you in two. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. 
is the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubry, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, Alex Dean is the political consultant and Paul Embry is the author, fireman, trade unionist and semi-pro Prince Harry lookalike. <laughs> I might have added that last one in there, but uh, you could. That is definitely a profession I you could go into. I think I might try and get my way into the palace have you been and walk, asked out, for walk any, out on the balcony have you been just to asked confuse for any a few people with my arm around, arm arm around Kate or something. Have you been uh, autograph um, hunted? No, but somebody did tell me to go back to California. Did they? So That's bit, not very nice, that bit, is it? That was a bit harsh. <laughs> came down from East Anglia. Yeah, well, I'm astonished, actually. I would imagine a few tourists might have been doing double takes or something when there they saw There were one or today. two double takes. I should have shaved the beard off. Look, I don't think you look that much like Harry. The beard was a nightmare. You look a lot more like Harry than a lot of the professional lookalikes look like Charles and Some of them are rubbish, to yeah. be honest. I, I could steal their thunder and, and uh, you know, get some of their business, frankly. Uh, well, you guys have just been talking about the local elections. Mike said, I voted Lib Dems because I've lost faith with the Tories. Never, though, he says, would I vote for Starmer. Um, Richard said, the local election results have zero correlation to general election outcomes, in his view. Uh, Arnold said, I spoilt my ballot because there was not a reform candidate. Um, Labour jumping up and down saying we're on tr track to win general election. Lord help us if they do, says Ray. There you go. I think I've got a few more of your uh, images coming up showing me uh, how and where you will be. There you go, I think. Can we see those? Yes, look at that. A nice hand-knitted um, thing there. That is King Charles. Love the knitting. A skill that seems to be lost on many of the young these days. Nice little garden party there. Nice flag sticking out the plant pots. Nice sunny, nice sunny area there, I like it. I'm so nosy, I love these kind of things. Look at the dog, the dog's got the flag in its mouth. Bless him. Yeah, it's very nice, isn't it? I just like nosing at people's houses as well. One more, I think. <laughs> one more for the road, oh yes, there you go. We're not messing around, I don't know if it's one house or two houses, but whatever it is, they are not messing around. They've got their Union Jacks in their windows with pride. That's what I like to see on this coronation weekend. Well, you just mentioned beards then. Uh, it was a nice link there. See what you did. Good segue, impressive. It was. Yeah, I want yeah, yeah. to talk beards because let me ask you this: Do you think police officers should have beards? Does it matter? Uh, well, apparently, according to Police Scotland, who have now said that officers must be clean-shaven, uh, then yes, it does matter to them. Apparently, it's nothing to do with tidiness or uniform rules or anything like that. Guess what it is? 
COVID. I thought we'd moved on from that, but no, apparently these officers need to all be clean shaven in order to properly wear their PPE face mask. Don't forget, by the way, this is, of course, despite the World Health Organization declaring today that the COVID emergency is over. Well, it would be rude for me not to start with a bearded man to my right. Um, people often, when you're on, they email in and say, how come Paul's got a beard if he's uh, in the fire service? Are you allowed beards in the fire service? Very good question. Um, currently, I'm not operational in the sense of I'm not riding fire engines at the moment. I've, right. got, a, I've got a desk job at the fire right. service headquarters, so that means that there's no issue with me having a beard. But if, as is very possible, I, I go back on a fire engine, then I would have to remove it because, of course, firefighters are required to wear breathing apparatus going yeah. into irrespirable atmospheres. And if you've got a... If you've got a beard, it pre prevents a seal, a proper seal, uh, around your face. In terms so that's of the, the safety. So if there mask. was like um, an all hands to the deck, I don't know, like huge, um, I, I don't want to really say the word, so don't like, you know, wish it will happen. But if there was like a huge emergency, all hands to the deck. So would all you guys have to just jump, get into the uh, engines and off you go? What, you're running down the stairs, having a little shave before you go? Or no, what? very very simple. If you're an operational firefighter, you should never arrive for duty with even just a, a small bit of stubble. You should always be clean shaven um, because firefighters will frequently have to wear that breathing apparatus um, and they need to they need to do that when the bells drop they need to do that and they need to do it sometimes within minutes of leaving the fire so station. So that's safety which I can kind of get you need a nice seal whatever uh, this one though the police is all about the PPE for Covid I thought life had moved on from that. Well I tend to agree I mean I, as I've just Kind of, kind of adumbrated in terms of the fire service. There are sometimes good reasons for it. There are sometimes good reasons why personnel in a particular industry should be clean shaven. Um, it strikes me that, that this is not what I would consider a particularly convincing reason. I mean, we can have a debate about masks because the truth is, I, I think the evidence for, for masks preventing transmission of COVID um, was pretty thin, to be perfectly honest. Um, and when you look at some of the studies that have been done over the last few months, um, proper detailed studies, uh, it shows that actually the masks were, were virtually next to useless. And let's not forget that many of our politicians, many of our senior medical advisors, even the World Health Organization at the, at the beginning of the pandemic said, actually, there's no need for masks. We're not calling for masks. But something happened. There was no evidence that suddenly appeared saying, oh, this is why we should now wear them. Uh, and I was struck by Deborah Cohen, who was the um, the medical uh, correspondent for the health correspondent for BBC Newsnight, uh, who at the time tweeted that she'd spoken to a source at the World Health Organ Organization who had said that this was purely political. The, 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 they'd been lobbied, essentially, and, and they'd come under pressure. So, you know, it's sometimes a good reason. I don't think this is a convincing reason. Um, it seems to me that uh, Police Scotland have kind of gone out on a limb with this. I'm not aware of any other police service that is doing the same thing and I can understand if I if I were a police officer north of the border I would be a little bit anxious and angry about it. Well apparently four um, officers are apparently looking at taking legal action in relation to the policy. The Met Police, just to give a separate example, their policy is be beards and moustaches are allowed but they mustn't look and chemistry you have to keep them trimmed and short. What do you make of it all Alex? So with immaculate timing the police in Scotland come out with this the same week the WHO say that Covid is over mm -hmm. so I mean wonderful and when I was uh, a boy in Suffolk they didn't the say it's over they said the emergency they, they said the pandemic is over, is over. yeah quite right good, good clarification when I was a boy in Suffolk, uh, the police officer who used to come round to our schools and give talks in assemblies, uh, it was called Roger Depper, and he had a beard, and everybody loved him. He was a really nice guy, he was a great ambassador for the police. So for me, growing up, policemen did have beards. Uh, and, you know, for that matter, my, my late father uh, had a beard, so kind of authority figures around me have had beards, and that's been fine. I misunderstood this when I first saw the headline, and I thought it was about tidiness, in the same way that you were talking about the Met guidelines. For me, a beard is fine, as long as it's neat and tidy. Um, I want the police to look um, well turned out, and I don't want them to look like they're, you know, swat waddling around, covered in uh, bits of kit more suited to some sort of uh, guerrilla organisation, hands tucked into um, stab vests, uh, as if they are the paramilitary wing of the Guardian coming to talk to you about your tweets. <laughs> I think they are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, but so, but it, alas, it's not about that. It's about COVID, so I have considerably le less sympathy for it. For me, a beard is context-specific. A beard like Paul's, well-trimmed and well-kept, totally fine. 
Is Pleasure. that well trimmed? Because your beard looks... I've never really studied men's beards, but yours looks quite long to me. Says she. Um, no, but I've never, I'm only I'm sitting staring at you now, and you're talking about is that a well trimmed beard? Yeah, I don't know. yeah, is it? Well, I hope so. I, I hope so. I do keep it regularly trimmed, and okay. I've never had any, like, I've so never had any complaints. Your face in a very, very bizarre have a, have a way now. It if you like to. I, 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 I am rereading a library book that I stole when I was about nine years of age. Uh, you can still return that, you know. <laughs> no, I think that that library's long gone now. <laughs> you uh, had to turn it to another library. And no, but I'm reading it to my son. Oh, I see. And it's Roald Dahl, and it's the Twits. Yeah. So it's all about um, mm. this guy, and he's got this massive bushy beard, and he's got all of mm. his food that lives in there. And I remember reading it as a young girl and being a bit like you. Yeah. You would know. Uh, Sorry, the king just went past. I mean, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> just pointing out oh, yes. that, that enormous noise behind us. Is, is right, in fact look at, yes, but hang on. Can you see? Yeah. Look at uh, everybody. Look yeah. at this convoy. Yeah. Now, what gets me, and I say this every night, right? Look at this convoy. Are you telling me that they are electric vehicles? I don't believe that there will be. Did you see that well, massive convoy? I did see the did king do a double take and he did spotted me. Did you notice that? Yeah, he was well, like, yeah, what's the boy the doing out of the loose? Yeah, <laughs> coming, like, back to, coming back to the beard. What's Harry doing there? He's not allowed in till tomorrow. <laughs> Honestly, I do. I have a rant about those massive convoys all the time because I look at them and I think they don't look very environmentally friendly to me. Why do you need so many vehicles like that? Anyway, that's nothing point. to do with I'm beards. not going to argue with you. You were no. saying about the twits and yes. uh, the and and I, beards. I was going to make the point, you as a Tory would know this, that, that allegedly Margaret Thatcher was very anti-beard and that's refused true, to put anyone in her cabinet who had a beard. Is there any truth I to that? I don't know if it's as hard and fast as that. I'd have to have a think she didn't back like to it, did she? ministers, but she didn't like beards. That's true. Let me very quickly ask you, what about tattoos, like visible tattoos? Yeah, so I don't want to be thought... It, I was just dodging the question by saying I want the beard to be um, uh, tidy or rather than unkempt. I don't think that police officers should have facial tattoos. I, I think that's the sort of so thing that undermines... So facial, but any other ones, OK. Well, I mean, plenty of ex-servicemen have got yeah, uh, tattoos all over their arms and, and backs and so forth, and I, got no, I want to encourage those people into um, our police, but uh, the idea of a tattoo on your face, I think, fundamentally says you, you care very little about your employment prospects, and, and if you've done that, then I think you probably shouldn't be in the police force. Or they might have been in within a certain crowd when they was young, which yeah. actually might stand them in good so, stead. So when you grow up, get it taken off? Mm -hmm. What do you think? To uh, very quickly, because I've got to go to my break. But what do you think? Um, visible lot, tattoos. Lots of firefighters have tattoos because lots of them served in the Royal Navy, and it's a bit of a tradition in the in the Royal Navy. Um, I, I would be uncomfortable with a police officer with some kind of spider tattoo covering his his whole face and, and neck. For me, that's I, a I bit hate... of an extreme example. It, it, it who's, probably got, is, who's got a full spider tattoo covering their entire face? You no, know, sometimes sometimes people do, but I guess it's a case of where do you where do you draw the line? You know, it, it, so, so so to speak. So, yeah, exactly, so, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, right, look, see, look at all these cars. On they come, look. Among they continue. Um, I don't really know the first thing about car engines, but I do. I just cannot help but look at all them and just think, I'm not sure how environmentally friendly it is. Uh, you two are just looking at my life I'm a bit daft, but I think I've got a point. Anyway, quick break. When I come back, I'll have some of your thoughts, but also I want to talk prisoners. We all know we've got gaps in the labour market at the moment. Is the answer then to put more prisoners on day release and get them to do the work? See you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you in whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain 
is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. What, yeah. Benjamin, yeah. That, that, is, that is... The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Juber, keeping you company live from outside Buckingham Palace right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, Alex Dean is the political consultant and Paul Embry is the author, fireman and trade unionist. Lots of you guys uh, have been getting in touch and thank you as well for sharing with me your coronation pictures. I'm very much enjoying seeing them. Um, talking about the beards and stuff, Alison said she just doesn't understand what difference it makes. And look at this little um, image that one of my viewers has sent in. It's my twin. It's um, it's a little. Um, I don't know what dog it is. I'm not very good at my dog. Um, yeah, but it's little it's dogs. Money for that. <laughs> little, it's nice little dogs getting into the coronation suite. Then one with a little uh, Union uh, Jack flag on its head. The other one with a bird tie, the same as mine. My producer just said it's like my twin, but the dog's better looking. I found that pretty harsh. Uh, window display there. We've got matching um, cushions and uh, flags in the window. Nice little setup there on the on the table. Another nice little window. I like it. You're all uh, not messing around. Cupcakes. Look at that. They look very nice. Oh, they're making me hungry out there. Yeah, I'm hungry now. Mm. They are making me hungry. Oh, yes. Look at that fireplace, everybody. Fat. Look at that. Impressive. Yes, look at that. Street. Hey, I hope you got your um, health and safety authorization for putting those buntings up. We'll talk about that before the end of the program. Some councils, by the way, saying that you had to uh, fill in these three pages of uh, documentation asking for permission to put your bunting up. What is going on in this country? Uh, anyway, Stephen says, I don't really care about policemen with beards, but I don't like seeing them with tattoos. It makes them look like thugs and creates a bad impression. That's a bit uh, stereotyping going on there, uh, Stephen. You think everyone with tattoos um, is a bit th uh, thuggish? John says, never mind beards. They look like they've been, uh, yeah, another one. He just doesn't like the tattoos either. Actually, a lot of you, uh, it's tattoos that's turning you off when it comes to smartness and not beards. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Government ministers are planning to let out thousands more prisoners, apparently, on day release in order to plug labour shortages in the economy. The plan, uh, in essence, is basically to enhance vocational training for some prisoners, as well as enrolling others in apprenticeships. Well, I have to say, you know, on the face of it, when you've got to start thinking creatively now, Alex, about yeah. what are we going to do to bolster the workforce in this country, do you agree with this? Is that a good idea? I probably agree with the outcome. I'd I'm not sure I agree with the motivation that gets them to that outcome. My time at the bar, especially, saw a lot of frequent flyers in the criminal justice system, people with repeat convictions. And one of the things that you can do to help someone break that cycle of conviction is uh, teaching them a trade, uh, whatever it may be, teaching them um, uh, a, a, a skill. And this, another thing you can do is to help them demonstrate that they understand the value of work. And um, if you can do one of those things in the course of someone's uh, incarceration, then it's all for the better. 
In fact, I think the only thing that's um, even more positive for people I in prison is teaching them to read if they don't know mm. how. And that's if you look at indices of most things, they make almost no difference to people in prison. They go in, lifestyle doesn't change. When they come out, they, they offend again. So you go in and you learn a trade. You come out, you, you've got a much better chance of not reoffending. I mean, if you don't, if you, come, if you didn't know how to read, you go in, you learn how to read. Your reoffending falls off a cliff. But after that, uh, I think teaching someone um, the ability to hold down a job and, and to work uh, it is really positive. So I'm not sure I'd do it for the reasons they're setting out, but I think the outcome is super. So if you just to fast forward a bit, if you're taking a prisoner out of prison, putting them onto day release in the world of work, do you think they should get the same wages as, as everybody else? No. And um, what tends to happen is that you have a, a prison account and money is deposited in that pretty small, small bit, although some criminals were dumping huge amounts of cash in them at one point, uh, amusingly. But, but that's supposed to be for, you know, your use of the canteen and for uh, buying small uh, luxuries in the prison and, and you can have um, you could even have a reserve part of that that you get when you come out and that that uh, that amount is saved up for you in the course of your time working in prison and I'm actually not against that at all but then if you're an employer and let's just say you can get some fella there for ten pound forty odd minimum wage or right. you can get that prisoner there for a fiver an hour you're going to staff your business with these prisoners and, and the, bang that, goes the job and that's the reason I was saying that I'm probably in favor of it for the outcomes in terms of learning a trade or something like that. I'm not in favour it for the employment impact on the local economy because what it does is often price out the person who's not incarcerated, who hasn't done anything wrong, uh, from doing the work because you get a deep discount on the prisoner. So it's not for that reason that I do it. Paul Embry? I think broadly it's a good idea with the right safeguards, of course, um, but I think they should be paid and I think they should be paid the going rate for the job, actually. I don't think it is acceptable that any employer would be able to get labour on the cheap. Now, whether that labour is somebody who is a prisoner or whether it's somebody who's just walked in off the street, um, it just strikes me as absolutely wrong that an employer um, could benefit from that cheap labour. So I would say... But you no have different scales of minimum wage, though, now, don't you? So if someone's 18, for example, they get a different wage to someone that's 25, and I imagine that that is to uh, reflect the fact that their outgoings and all the rest of it and their experience perhaps is less. Well, so why would you give, like, a plus 25-year-old well, the same I, I, as a... I would pay, I would pay an 18-year-old the same as a 50-year-old if they were doing the same job and putting in the same effort and, you know, producing the well, same thing. Hang on. Um, I think it's entirely reasonable to say, well, if, if you're 18, you deserve to be paid the same rate as a 50 year old. Now, if you are a prisoner and you're going out and working 8, 9, 10 hours a day for an employer, I don't see any convincing reason why you should not get the going rate for the job. Whether or not I, you're able to, to spend it, of course, no, no, while you're in prison is a different I, thing. It could go into your account and you could then spend it when you're released. I um, see at least two reasons. The first but the other danger, let me just say this, the, the other finger. danger is that what you would have is a, a, a huge, if you say thousands of prisoners are suddenly entering the labour market on a cheap rate of pay, you just have this huge instant reserve army of labour available to employers, which will have the very effect of driving well, down wages for people who are out there living said already. an honest um, life. But, but that needs to be addressed. Yeah, the, the, the first reason that pay prisoners should be paid less is that it's a part of their incarceration. Uh, you know, you restrict their freedom of movement, and you've got to. Ha it's not just the same as being someone in the workforce for those 10 hours. You are still a serving prisoner. And the second is to incentivise someone to take the risk of taking you on in the first place, because plainly it is some kind of risk. And mm -hmm. if employers get no benefit from from doing it. Outside of altruism, uh, you might find them ill-motivated to take a serving prisoner. But maybe there's a compromise. Maybe there's a compromise. You pay them the going rate, so Paul ticks his box, but you take the board on lodgings off them and give that to the state instead to pay for their keep. What would you make to that one? Uh, quick break. When I come back, I'll have some more of your thoughts. But I wonder, do you think councils are being a bit killjoy uh, when it comes to allowing people to put their flags up and out and about in your local area? Have you been able to do it? We'll come back and look at that. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News.
First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubry, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight alongside me, Alex Dean, the political consultant, and Paul Embry, the author, fireman, and trade unionist. And look, if I'm going to sit outside of Buckingham Palace dressed like an absolute wally, I've got to get into the spirit and raise a glass, haven't I, too? Our forthcoming king. Cheers. Are you going to Cheers. make me do, I'm a, you, the king. You do realise I'm a Republican and you're, you're making me take part in a toast to His Majesty the King. Pack it in and get it down, yeah. Sacrilege you're for people. Outside, like God um, save the King and better Palace. wisdom just, for Paul Embry. Just for you. Are you going to be um, pledging your uh, allegiance I tomorrow? Shall. Will you really? Oh, sure. So you're going to sit in front of your TV screen and shout the words to here? Well, I was thinking I was definitely going to come here and I see how busy it is. I may not, but yes. Um, I don't even think I need to ask you. Are um, you going to be saying am I the hell? words? Am I hell? Um, no. Look, I mean, I, I think it will be a good day. I'm. I'm a, I always describe myself as a mild Republican. I'm not a fervent Republican. Um, my guillotine blade would be much smaller than many other people's. But um, no, you I can't say it. we're on like lawns I, of Buckingham Palace. I think Pack it they, in. they'll drag me off to the tower, won't they? But I, I think broadly, the, the royal family. Um, work hard. I'm not one of these people who say they don't work hard, they're all scroungers, I think they work hard. I just think as a grown-up society we should be allowed to elect our head of state like so many other countries oh, do. Oh yeah, that'd be and, great, you know, they, like, well, If Charles III wants to in, stand in that election, In then recent times, let him do it. you would have let had President jo Boris Johnson or President Tony Blair, yeah, but and I'm not sure any of us want that. But, but the difference is you can get rid of them, whereas if you end up with a king or a queen who you don't like, you okay. have no mechanism so to he, get rid he, of them. Here's the test. We had a referendum on the alternative votes. I voted in favour of that reform. My side lost and I accept the result. If we had a referendum on the monarchy and your side lost, would you accept that and then forget well, it? Of course. Well, no, you never, I would never forget it. Or but, move but, on from but, it but, but, in a way that the losing Brexit side hasn't, is my point. Look, of course people are still entitled to make their case. They can't be told to shut up for the no, rest no, no, of no, their no. lives. But if there were a referendum and people said they wanted to keep the monarchy, then of course right, I, let I, me I would ask accept you this, then. And so I think they would vote that way, by the way. You say you're a mild Republican, right? But surely you can't deny, coming down here, seeing all this, all the preparations, there's a fantastic vibe going on. 
on. There is yeah. an energy. I know that's just me because you sat next to me, but generally well, broader. You must be getting into it a little bit. I think these are generally unifying days and people enjoy them and I think they're pretty harmless. And in truth, I don't actually think there's much difference as far as ordinary people are concerned, whether they live within a monarchical system or whether they live within a republic. Uh, for there's example, something different well, about hold on. I, I if you, a presidential if you, if you inauguration. Compare, it's not if like you this. compare, for example, Finland to Denmark, Finland is a parliamentary republic, Denmark is a monarchy. I don't think that the citizens or the subjects of those two countries would think that they are any better or worse off for having but their that particular is a bizarre system. comparison when we live in Britain it and the obvious comparison is our it... English speaking places that don't have a king and are nothing like uh, a, 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 as exciting at times like this. I've been to the United States in presidential inaugurations. It's not like this. this what, the one thing we miss in this wonderful um, broadcasting setup is that within the peacefulness of this media environment, we fail to convey the absolutely extraordinary pandemonium that's already going on yeah, all the way even. down the mall. People, uh, people are camping at the Green Park is full, St James's Park is full. Oh, oh, and, and it's, it's a it's wonderful kind of atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, honestly, there and, is. And good luck to those people, and good luck to you if you're, if you're going to pledge your allegiance. Absolutely good luck to you. But the, I'm not going to pledge the, my allegiance. The point is, no, 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 Alex. I will. Yeah, no. Um, but the point is, there are millions of people in this country, and you have to accept it, who look at this with a raised eyebrow and think, actually, it's all a bit odd, and it's not really for me. Well, and you know what I'd say to I'm not people? particularly monarchist. And, 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 and feel quite aloof from I'd the whole say thing, to, those to be honest. People, Tiny spend minority. tomorrow, then, sat in your house watching reruns of Jubes and Co. And let everyone else I get on with. Yeah, do it. Is yeah, it let ch- everyone else get on with the uh, it's a tiny ceremony. Tiny fringe position. Uh, let me have a look. Tiny fringe. Fringe. There are, Alex, there are millions right, who have got little interest. Too. I don't care come about on, people that are not on. interested in the royals anymore. Right, show me. Have we got any more pictures uh, of any of my viewers? Because you've all been sending in lots of your stuff. Hold on. I do like to have a little nosy. I like to share with you all what's going on. Here we go. Another nice garden. Is that a pond or something you've got in the middle there? I think it is. If my eyes do not deceive me, yes. Well, I like your display. One more. Oh, actually, I don't think it is a pond. I think it's a flower bed. Cool, blimey, what on earth's that? That's somebody's... Is that, that's not someone's house. That must it's, be it's a, a shop. Some, I think that's a, a restaurant or a shop or something it's in a somebody's yeah, uh, it's a town yeah. or something. Whatever it is, though, it's very impressive, isn't it? We're looking at this, by the way, on a tiny little monitor. So if you're thinking Michelle wears glasses, why can't you see that that's not a pond? In my defence, I am looking at that on a very tiny screen. Um, anyway, very, very briefly, because look at the time, it does indeed fly. Lots of you, by the way, getting in touch about the prisoner. Uh, we are just talking about should you uh, put prisoners out to work. There are so many of you that have come up with the same idea, which is why don't you get prisoners to do the potholes in the road? Uh, so many people think that that would be the right idea. Um, Barry says, why don't you put prisoners, I mean, I shouldn't laugh, I'm sure it's a sensible suggestion from me, but why don't you put prisoners on bicycles, which generate electricity to charge uh, up batteries, which could then be used for powering up their own prison and save the electricity bills. There's, an, there's a Black Mirror episode where that is the plot, the oh, dystopian it? future of humanity. <laughs> With all the prisoners cycling away on their pedals. Um, Michael says, my daughter is in prison and she would welcome the chance to wear to relieve the boredom yep. of being locked in a cell for most of the and day. And it's productive, not Michael, just watching the te- telly. Michael, I'm going to be a bit harsh there on your daughter, and I don't mean to be, don't judge me, but actually I would like people to feel a bit bored and all the rest of it in prison, because then they might think twice about going there again. I hope you don't think I'm being too harsh. Uh, anyway, look, that's all I've got time for. Um, whatever you are doing this weekend, however you're into the monarchy or not, have yourself a fantastic weekend. I very much enjoyed uh, the week outside of Buckingham Palace. Um, our, content, our coverage, of course, will continue over the weekend. Lawrence Fox is up next. Gentlemen, thank you very, thank you very much. much. What's the matter with him? He's always laughing. He's like a little naughty schoolboy. <laughs> I'll find out in the break what's going on. Paul, thank you very much My for your pleasure. company. Have a fantastic one, everybody. And I will see you on Monday. Cheers. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie Shuttleworth from the Met Office. Now it's going to be a pretty unsettled weekend for the coronation across the UK and that's because low pressure is still in charge. It's been dragging these fronts northwards across the UK. Now through Friday night we'll see some respite, however the southwest will start to see the next batch of rain by the early hours. So for many it'll be a drier night than we've had throughout the day. But there will be a lot of cloud around, particularly across northeastern areas of Scotland, where it'll be quite misty and murky well into Saturday morning. With all that cloud around, it'll be a mild night across the UK, lows of around 8 or 9 degrees.
So a pretty mild start to the weekend, but rain will soon start to arrive into the southwest, bringing outbreaks of rain for much of the day here. Now there'll be a dry